This is the third lecture for the nuclear chemistry uh, lectures, and it'll follow along in your fill-in-the-blank notes right after what you finished for Half-Life in Part 2. So what we're going to look at first is ways of detecting radiation. So three instruments that you'll see that were used to detect radiation are film badges, scintillation counters, and Geiger counters. This is what a Geiger counter looks like. There's a lot of different types, but basically, just like we said, it measures levels of radiation. When we're measuring radiation, we use specific units. Just like for mass, we use units like grams or pounds. So for radiation, we use what we call REMS, which is short for Rotogen Equivalent for Man. And it's named after Wilhelm Rotogen, who discovered x-rays back in 1895. And just for your information, the average American is exposed to about 360 millirems a year from natural and man-made radiation sources. Remember when we talk about radiation particles, another word for those is ionizing radiation. And we say it's ionizing because the radiation is energetic enough to ionize or split apart matter that it collides with. Uh, ionizing radiation can cause change in the actual chemical makeup or the elemental makeup of things. And these changes in humans can cause genetic defects or cancer. So in humans, the way that radiation affects the body is actually kind of from the inside out. So it starts with the smallest particles in your body, atoms, and then your molecules, and then your cells, and then your tissues, and then your organs, and eventually it affects your whole body. This is just a chart. You don't need to know this, but it's just something to look at to kind of get an idea of where radiation exposure comes for people like us. So you can see there's different parts of the pie graph. The biggest one is radon, which is just out in our atmosphere. You see also cosmic, so that means coming from the sun or the, some other universes. Uh, terrestrial means coming from the earth, so that's like what we talked about, how there's some in the earth's crust. And internal means it's radiation that's actually in our bodies, and that's totally normal to have some of that. When we're talking about how much damage radiation does to a person, there's a few factors that we have to look at. So those factors are the dose, how much, the exposure time, so how long you were exposed to it, the area that was exposed of your body, and the type of tissue in your body that was exposed. Just to give you an idea of the effects of short-term radiation exposure on humans, uh, looking at it in doses, and again, we're looking at that in the unit REM. So between 0 and 25 REMs, there's no detectable effects. Between 25 and 50 REMs, you'll get a temporary decrease in white blood cells. Between 100 and 200 REMs, you'll have nausea and a substantial decrease in your white blood cell count. And 500 or more REMs, you're going to have about a 50% chance of death within 30 days. So radiation can, or radiation exposure can be very serious. But before anybody freaks out, don't worry, because in your regular everyday life, you're only getting a dose of a few millirems, which are way smaller than even the 0 to 25 rem category. Okay, moving on to something a little different. We're going to talk about nuclear fission and fusion. People tend to get these mixed up, but fission is when you're splitting the nucleus of an atom, and fusion is when you're combining the nuclei of two or more atoms. So you can think of these as fission is coming apart and fusion, you can think of like fusing, is coming together. Nuclear fission is the process that fuels nuclear reactors. You've probably heard of nuclear reactors before. Nuclear reactors are also responsible for producing about 21% of all the electricity that we use here in the United States. And the fuel that those nuclear reactors use is the element uranium. 
When we look at a nuclear reactor, they have four main parts. They have the control rods that you can see going up and down. They have the water that they use to cool. They have the fuel assemblies, and they have a pressure vessel that it's all contained in. So this is just a picture of what's happening in fission. So basically what you're seeing is uranium atoms are splitting, so they're going through fission, and as they split, they're releasing a whole lot of energy in the form of tons and tons of heat. And then what happens in the nuclear reactor is that heat is transferred from the reactor core to steam generators. And those steam generators are going to power a turbine, which is kind of like a big fan, and that's what creates the electricity that we can use. So here's another picture of what's happening in a nuclear reactor. So you can see the turbine I was talking about kind of looks like a big fan, and that's what's going to create the electricity. Here's a larger picture of what a nuclear power plant might look like. You can see the reactor in the middle and the pressure vessel right underneath. And it's got steam generators that are housed in the same area. And then if you look over to the side of that, you can see the turbine, which is going to be turning and producing that electricity. Here's another type of nuclear reactor that instead of using steam, it's using boiling water. So just a different way to get electricity and energy that we can use from a nuclear reaction. Here's one more picture of a different kind of nuclear reaction. This one is using pressurized water. And if nuclear reactors are something that you're interested in, you can definitely look them up on Google and there's a whole ton of information and different pictures and videos that will show you specifically how nuclear reactors work and the process that it goes through to make electricity. It's really interesting, but it's beyond the scope of our class. So if it's something you want to check out, it's definitely interesting to look at. Okay, last thing we need to talk about is the uses for radiation. So there's a lot of uses uh, that are good for radiation. So it can be used to diagnose and treat illnesses like chemotherapy. It can be used to kill bacteria and preserve food. It can be used to process sludge for fertilizer and soil conditioners. You can use it to locate underground natural resources. It's also used in smoke detectors, in the non-stick stuff on frying pans, and it also is used to make ice cream. A few more uses, they use radiation to grow stronger crops. It powers satellites and possibly provides future electrical needs for space labs. It measures air pollution. It can prove the age of works of art through radiochemical dating like we were talking about before. And it's also used in forensics and CSI type things to solve crimes. And that's the end of your lectures on nuclear chemistry.